Kemu Damo, who was the Buddha's aunt, was also the first Buddhist nun. Without her, you would not be here. So I'm sorry, I do not know these names in Tibetan. I only know the Sanskrit names. In the very south of Nepal, there is a place called Lumbini. So maybe some of you have been to Lumbini in South Nepal, which is where the Buddha was born. So near to Lumbini is a, a place called Kapilavastu. And this was the capital of the Sakya uh, clan. You know, the Shakyas, the Shakyas were a, a clan of people. And the king was named Sudodana. He had two wives. One was called Mahamaya, and one was called Maha Pajapati. Now, as you know, the mother of the Buddha was Mahamaya, and she gave birth to the Buddha in this grove, this kind of garden called Lumbini. But after one week, she died, and she went to heaven. That's what we're celebrating with Labhadduchen. So then Maha Pajapati, the second sister, she brought up the Buddha as if it was her own son. She even suckled him with her milk and she brought him up completely. Even she was only his aunt, she was like a mother to him. The Buddha grew up in the palace, as you know. Then he saw the four sights and then he left the palace. This is not the life of the Buddha. This is Mahaprajapati. So very quickly, the Buddha grew up. He got married to Yashodhara. Then when he was 29, he left home. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, everybody was very, very sad because he was the only son, and he was going to be next king, and then he left. And so everybody was really not happy. They were very, very unhappy when he, he went away. Yeah, it is even said that Mahapajapati cried so much she became blind. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then after six years after the Buddha left his home, he became a Buddha. And then he began wandering around in northeast India. And after six more years, so this is 12 years, he came back to Kapilavastu to the palace. So then, of course, everyone was so happy to see him. They were so happy that he had come back again, Shuddha Dharma, the king, and all the courtiers, and all the village people, and all the ladies of the court, and everybody was very, very happy to welcome back, now not just a prince, but a Buddha. And so then all the men in the kingdom, Shodhadharma and all the men, they said, we are going every day to take teachings from the Buddha. But women, they cannot come, only men. So then every day the men would come back and they would say, wow, it's so fantastic. What a tremendous teacher. Wow, I really understand things now. Oh, and the women were going, hmm, why are you? So then the women were very unhappy that the men were getting all this teaching and they could not go and meet with the Buddha. So they went to Mahaprajapati and they said, look, it's really not fair. We also have devotion. We also want to hear the Buddha. So you please go and talk with Sudhadana and ask him to, uh, to uh, ask the Buddha what we can do. So then they decided, the Buddha said, yes, of course, the women should also come. So then we will do it that in the morning, I give a talk to the men. And in the afternoon, then all the women come and I will give a Dharma talk to the women. And so then the women were also very happy and they had great devotion 
and many of them became Genyan Ma and practiced very, very sincerely. Okay, so then the Buddha went again, and after some years, there was a big problem in the Shakya country because there had been a big drought. You understand drought? No rain. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the river Rohini had become just a little trickle, very, very small. So on one side of the river were the Kaliya clan, which Mahaprajapati belonged to. Mm. On the other side were the Shakyas. And so both of them wanted the water because they needed it for their rice fields, but there was no water. So then they, the first the farmers started fighting each other, and then they brought in the army. So then as on both sides of the river, the army spread out, ready to attack each other. So on one side you had his mother's clan, the Kolia. On the other side you had his father's clan, the Shakya. So then the Buddha was not there, but he knew this was happening, right? He had like a vision that this was happening. So then he um, emanated himself to that place and he sat cross-legged up in the sky. Then he came back down and he spoke to both sides and said, you know, basically, what are you doing? And what is more precious, your blood or water? And so they said, well, blood is very most precious. And he said, so why are you spilling your blood for the sake of the water? You must stop now. So then he gave a Dharma talk to both sides, to the Kolia and the Shakya. And the, the army and the courtiers and the farmers, they were so inspired that hundreds of them left home and became monks. But this was very difficult because they had all left home and then all their wives were left behind like widows, right? Nobody to protect the home, nobody to help work the fields, nobody to protect the, the, the town. It was all the men had gone off to become monks. So then again, the women were very unhappy. And they went to Mahaprajapati and they said, what are we going to do? Now we have no men here. We are left all alone. Why don't we also leave home and join the homeless life? And so therefore, these many women, said to be 500 women, they went with Mahaprajapati to see the Buddha and asked him, please, can we also leave the home and lead the homeless life like the men have done? And the Buddha said, no, no, Mahaprajapati, please don't ask that. This is not a good time. It is better that you shave your hair and wear white clothes, but stay home. Don't go out from home to homelessness. So then the Buddha left and he went with all his monks to Vaishali. And then all the Sakya women and Mahapraji party at the top, they decided that they would shave their hair and they would wear rag robes and they would follow the Buddha and ask again. So then these were mostly court ladies, you know, they were high class ladies, they weren't mostly village girls. And, but they, they decided to go with no shoes and they would not go in a carriage or on a horse, they would walk like the Buddha walked. So they walked for 300 miles across India to find the Buddha. So eventually they got to Vaishali. As I say, it's about three, well, maybe 400 kilometers. 
very far, and they had never walked barefoot before on these bad roads. And so by the time they got to Vashali, they were very tired, exhausted. Their feet were all bleeding and swollen, and they were not looking good. So then again, Mahaprajapati approached the Buddha along with the 500 ladies and again asked for permission to go forth from home to homelessness. Mm. Mahaprajapati yeah. and all the ladies, mm. they went in front of the Buddha yeah. and they asked again for permission to go from home to homelessness. And again, the Buddha said, no, Mahaprajapati, please don't ask this now. This is not the time. So we have to ask ourselves, why did the Buddha say no? Now, of course, we do not know what was in the mind of the Buddha. I mean, we can't say, oh, well, the Buddha was thinking this or thinking that, because we don't know. But we can think about the situation. What was it that he, why was it that he kept saying, no, don't ask that now, don't ask that now? And um, most scholars think that the reason was because this was very early times still. And the monks were walking around and sleeping under trees in the forest. And for monks to walk around and beg for alms and sleep in the forest, no problem. But for women, it is very different because you, we cannot just go and sleep under a tree outside. It's very dangerous. It's dangerous not because of tigers, but because of men. So the Buddha, I, I think, perhaps really felt he could not take responsibility for the safety of all these women. In those days, Monks were not living in monasteries, right? They were out in the open. It, it took time for the jindaks to start offering land and then people building huts. At that time, they still just slept, wandered around and just slept wherever they were. Men can do that, but women, it's, they cannot do that. It, because, not because they are weak, but because they would be in danger. So three times the Buddha said no to Mahaprajapati, and she was crying and crying. All the ladies were crying. And then, <laughs> right, Ananda, our patron saint, he came, it was his aunt too, and he said, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. And she told him what the problem was. So then Ananda went to the Buddha. So then Ananda asked the Buddha two questions. He said, how many Sangha did the Buddhas of the past have? And the Buddha said they had a fourfold Sangha of monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen. And then Ananda said, is it possible for, to attain liberation in a female body? And the Buddha said, well, of course it's possible. It's the same. So then Ananda said, then, O Bhagavan, since all the past Buddhas had a fourfold Sangha, how come you don't want a fourfold Sangha? And since women can attain liberation, why are you creating an obstacle? So at that point, the Buddha kind of shrugged. <laughs> And he said to Mahaprajapati, Ehi Bhikkhuni. And then he told, so he, he just ordained her by saying, come Bhikshuni. And then he told the monks to ordain all the other 500 ladies. Mm -hmm. So after that, there was uh, the fourfold Sangha. And they all studied and practiced very sincerely, and eventually, not only Mahaprajapati, but all the 500 ladies all become, became arhat. 
And then the, the order of nuns spread very much. I mean, there were many, many women, not just the Sakyas, who um, left uh, home. And for many reasons, some were princesses, some were prostitutes. I mean, all kinds of people from all different around. And so many women came and uh, joined the order and then gained liberation. And the Buddha was very, very kind to them. If we read the early uh, sutras uh, dedicated to nuns, we can see the Buddha was very, very kind to them. And also Ananda and uh, some other monks, they taught them and they trained them. And they were praised them, this is foremost in meditation, this one is foremost in preaching, this one is foremost in kindness, and all sorts of foremost, best in this, best in that. But of course, the, the nuns didn't wander around like the monks had done. Gradually, not only for nuns, but for monks, um, big donors, big jindaks gave land and then um, on the land, they started building huts. And at first, this was intended for the monks, just for the rainy season, just for Yane. But then gradually, people said, no, please stay, please stay, please be here to teach us. So gradually, they stopped wandering, and they got settled. Yeah, in the early days, they were like sadhus. They just wandered around from place to place and uh, they didn't have any set place to live. But gradually, that was inconvenient, and so more and more, they became settled. Anyway, eventually, Maha Prajapati and all her first 500 nuns, they all got very old. She became, she said, 120. And so she wanted to die before the Buddha died. So she went to see the Buddha, and asked his permission to pass into Mahaparinirvana. So then the 500 nuns said, we also will pass into Nirvana. When you pass in Nirvana, we'll all go together. So then they went to see the Buddha, and they asked his permission to please enter into Nirvana. And the Buddha said, yes, yes, you can do that. That's OK, because you're very old now. but." Before you go, you should show people your, your cities, you know, your powers. Because normally in the Vinaya, monks and nuns are not permitted to show their cities, right? Because it, it's, it's not permissible. But the Buddha said, many people do not have faith in women, in nuns. And so therefore, it's important that before you go, you show your power, what you can do, so they will have faith. I'm looking for what she did. She, she rose up into the air. That was the first thing she did. And then, um, so in front of everybody, in front of all the Buddha and all the monks and nuns and all the crowds of people, um, and she did all sorts of, she was amazing. The point is that when the Buddha died, he just turned onto his right side and went. When Ma Prajapati died, she had this huge display. And then all the nuns likewise put this huge display. <laughs> and everybody went, wow! <laughs> no, but we should understand who Ma Prajapati was. She was very special. <laughs> so anyway, after she made this huge display, then all the nuns, the 500 nuns who had ordained with her, they likewise put on quite a display. Mm -hmm. So, and then after that, they passed into Nirvana. And then uh, their beer, the, the thing you carry, you know, a dead body, mm -hmm. that was carried by Ananda, Nanda, Rahula, and somebody else. And the Buddhas walked along beside it, touching it. And then they um, burned all the bodies of the 500 nuns. And then not long after that, the Buddha himself uh, entered into Nirvana. That is the story of Mahaprajapati. She was our great mother. Without her and her persistence and the help of Ananda, then 
of course, eventually the Buddha would have allowed nuns, but not as soon as he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it says that after the Buddha attained enlightenment in Bodhgaya, then Mara came and said to him, well, now you're a Buddha. Here you are, so you can go now. And so the Buddha said, no, Mara. First, I have to establish the fourfold Sangha. When the fourfold Sangha is well established, they are learning and meditating and preaching and expanding the Dharma. When this fourfold Sangha is like a table with four legs, it's very firm. So my fourfold Sangha, when it's flourishing, then that's it. I've done what I need to do and I will go. So this shows that right from the beginning, it was the Buddha's intention to start the fourfold Sangha, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like, oh, women want to join? Oh, how terrible. He knew they were going to join. He was a Buddha. And after the Buddha died, after his Mahapanivana, then the first people to pay respects were the nuns mm -hmm. before the monks. I mean, they explained it was because, Ananda, of course, Ananda said it's because the nuns have to go home and they can't go home in the dark, mm. so therefore we let them go first. Anyway, from the time of the Buddha, 2,600 years ago, until the present day, there have been nuns in Buddhist countries. So there are still nuns and they are still studying and practicing and propagating Dharma, so we should rejoice. <laughs>